mighty week, mighty week for all that good picking. How about birthdays and anniversaries? We want to sing to you. If you'll just come tripping up here. Oh, yes. Ken and Sharon Lee. I think we have a 50-year anniversary coming up. Amazing. Sister Gail has, an, has a birthday. It's really not a birthday. It's a birthday anniversary, really. You couldn't have birthdays every time. All right, anybody else? We. All right, Dewey and Betty. I would ask Dewey how many years, but I better ask Betty. How many? 58 years? <laughs> God bless him. Isn't it sweet? Good. Birthdays, anybody else? Be a good. Clyde. Come on, brother. Let him see what a good looking, good looking cracker is. A good looking cracker. Come on up here. All right, sing birthday to Brother Clyde and Sister Gail. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And happy birthday to you. Only one. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. Good to be in the house, Lord, this morning. Be honest. How many of you are just whipped tired today? Be honest. Did we not have a great week last week? Praise the Lord. Good to see all of you. Now, now listen, I've already had the, about 14 of you elderly ladies have asked me, what happened to all the beautiful arrangement? It's not Christmas anymore. We had to take it down. We've got new signs coming to replace these that we're going to keep up year round. So they're on their way. So leave me alone. good to be in the house of the Lord. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, if you've never been here, yeah. would you just raise your hand? Our ushers have a, a gift bag they want to give you in a, uh, the, right over here in the, in the back corner. Any others right here? If you'll just fill that out, it's uh, perforated. You'll rip that off and put it in the uh, offering bag as the ushers come by a little bit later. Any others visiting for the very first time upstairs down below? We're so happy to have you with us uh, this morning. Any others? Did any, has anybody noticed the, the front of our bulletins the last couple of weeks? Something we will never see ever in Tampa, Florida. But we do that on purpose because all the winter folks are here. And we want to keep you guys as long as we can because look what you have to go back to. You don't want to go back to that. Stay down here. Strawberries are fresh. It's warm. It's nice. It's good to see all of you. Let's get a songbook and stand. And let's sing like we've never sang before. Amen. Living by faith, page 162. And again, it's good to see you, you that are visiting, and especially our, our folks that just come all the time and love the Lord. It's, it's a good place, and it's a good uh, feeling to be in God's house. Uh, we had the most wonderful camp meeting. God just poured it out on us, and, uh, and it takes its toll on you. But bless God. Uh, I, I was blessed to get to attend every meeting, and I thank God for that. Good teaching, good preaching, good singing, powerful singing. I'm telling you, good, powerful preaching, powerful everything. They, living by faith, page 162, rare back and sing, I love to hear you. And really, there was a real great singing during camp meeting, and it just blesses me. It just pours it on me, and then I, yeah, I, I just like it. So I'm very much spoiled, so help me out. Here we go. Sing it. 
pretty now, I want to hear it. Sing it. Oh, I care not today what tomorrow may bring. If shadow or sunshine or rain, the Lord I know rules for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. From all harm's sake. I'm living by faith and I feel no alarm. Though tempest may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life, I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies. The master looks on at the strife. Living by faith. Trusting, confiding in His great love. Sing it. Come on. From all harm safe, in His sheltering arms, I'm living by faith. And I feel no alarm on the third. I know that He safely will carry me through. No matter what evil be tied, why should I then care though the tempest may blow if Jesus walk close to my side? Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. Sing it now. In his sheltering arms, I'm living by faith, and I feel no. What's the next thing on the agenda? Yes, our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day. Our troubles will then all be over. The Master so gently will lead us so late beyond the blessed heaven. Living by faith in Jesus, trusting, confiding in His great love. From all heart safe in His sheltering arms, I'm living by faith. Valerie asked me, why don't you ever do any more Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? So while you turn around and shake hands, sing this song. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior. Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth roll. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about. Ask the ushers to come. We'll come for this morning's tithes and offering. Sing it again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name Master 
Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Carlton family, Dennis and Leland's father, Doc, went home to be at the Lord last night. 96 years old. Uh, but praise the Lord, he was saved when he was 17. Amen. So we thank God for that. We thank God for that. So remember uh, their family. Let's remember Jim Evans in our prayers. Uh, let's remember Ken Shamblin as well in our prayers and the Shamblin family. And, and I know there's an un, some unspokens here today. Let's lift them up in prayer as well. Brother Tom, would you pray for us? Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. For the spirit to rain upon us. We thank you for it, Lord. We pray, dear God, today, if there's anyone here that don't know you as a personal Savior, Lord, this might be the day that they claim you. Yes. Lord, we pray that you yes, just bless these families, dear God, that's bereaved. Lord, we pray that you put your loving arms around them, Lord. Let them sense and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. We pray, dear God, for those that's got cancer and other sickness, dear Lord. We pray that if it's thy will, you'd heal them, Lord. We know that you can. All you'd have to do is say, be healed, and it would be done. We thank you, Lord, for everything you do for us. You said we have the faith of a grain of mustard seed. Yes. We can move a mighty mountain. Yes. And that's what we'd like to do on this. Yeah, day, bless you, buddy. We pray that you'd bless the band that they play today. Pray that you'll bless the singing, dear Lord. Anoint it with thy Holy Spirit. Pray that you'll bless the preaching today, dear God. Anoint the man, dear God, with our Holy Spirit as he Thank speaks. You. And we pray, dear Thank God, you bless this offering now. For we you. ask it all in our blessed holy name. Amen. Amen.
Well, everybody is talking about something you can hear as the crowd passes by. Some will talk about their wealth and their riches. Others talk about their trouble and strife. I don't know how to talk to a rich man when compared. I'm a beggar, no doubt. But if you're talking about that old time what you're talking about and if you're talking about that old time religion then i know what you're talking about about the kind that would make you love your neighbor when all satan will say turn about about the kind that will comfort you in sorrow Save me when my poor soul was sinking in sin. I'd like to talk about the time he has kept me through the shadows, through the storm, through the rain. I'd like to talk about the time of his coming when I see his sweet face in the clouds. And if you're talking Talking about that old time religion, then I know what you're talking about. About the kind that will make you love your neighbor when all Satan will say, Turn him out. About the kind that will comfort you in sorrow and never fail to make you shout. Then if you're talking about that old time religion, then I talking about and if you're talking about that old time religion then I know what you're talking about the old apostle under house arrest began to rise a message on behalf of one who surely deserved to die. Onesimus had stolen from his Lord and run away. But Paul led him to Jesus and now had come the day that he would return. Philemon's house and right the wrong he had done. So with letter in hand, he was told by God's man, It's time to go now, my son. So with trembling fear, the journey of Onesimus began. He knew the faith that he deserved for the wrong he had done to the at last he arrived and stood before the one whose mercy he pled. He fell to his knees and offered the letter, hoping that it would be read. Philemon took the letter and the writing he recognized. Here's what it said. I know that he's wrong to and run away. I know he's unworthy to live. But oh, Philemon, on my behalf, I'm asking you to forgive. Receive him as myself today. He's profitable now to me. Here's why. He's met the blessed Savior. He's not the man he used to be. And all that he owes to you in your house, regardless of the amount, 
I promise today to you I'll repay. Put that on my account. Oh, now there's another intercession story I should tell. You see, it explains how I was rescued from a devil's hell. I stood before the King of glory, guilty of the crimes that old Satan had reminded God. I committed so many times, oh, but the one who sat at God's right hand stood up and he made this decree. And then from his lips the sweetest request it was made in behalf of me i know that he's sinful and often fails and i know he's unworthy to live oh but jesus said oh my father on my behalf i'm asking you to forgive receive him into your house today for he belongs now to me his way was provided through the finished work at Calvary. His debt was all paid that wonderful day when he knelt beneath the blood flowing fount. So take all the wrong that he has done and put that on my account. You can take all the wrong that he has done. And I'm glad Jesus said, put that on my account. I believe that in the church today, we've grown accustomed to a lack of praise. And I'm afraid we think that it's supposed to be way oh but i'm here to tell you i believe that's not the way it has to be because when you think of all the lord has done for you and me then this ought to be what happens in this place somebody ought to say man and somebody ought to lift their hands somebody ought to stand and shout that they are glad they're born again and somebody ought to shed a tear and thank the lord that they're here somebody ought to come to this old altar while the lord is near and lord i pray today that somebody Why don't you just stand up and let's rejoice the lord a little now bit now if we ever really want Amen. to see old time revival like there used to be my friends, it's gonna have to start with you and me. We need to stop all of this looking around, waiting for someone else to make a sound. Because if Jesus saved your soul, oh, and you are heaven bound, well, then that ought to be enough to praise our King. Somebody ought to say, man. And somebody ought to lift their hands. Somebody ought to stand and shout that they are glad they're born again. And somebody ought to shed a tear and thank the Lord that they're here. Somebody ought to come to this old altar while the Lord is near. And Lord, I pray today that somebody is me. Lord, I pray today that somebody is me. I told Sunday school class, I, I wish we could have uh, live stream cameras all at the same time of all the pastors who are back in their pulpits this morning after being here this week just to see I mean, that, wouldn't that be just an encouragement to us? And even more so, maybe to see the look on some of their people's faces, like what in the world did they do with him down there? But I, I think that's one of the wonderful things 
about camp meetings, the encouragement we can be to others, and they go back to minister all across the country. And uh, I'm just thankful for his goodness and all that he's done for us. Thankful for all, all of you that worked and served. And uh, well, I tell you, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. And so I'm thankful. I'm very excited about 2015. To whom much is given, much is required. Well, I tell you what, he's been good to this group right here. He's been good to us. And I know there's needs today. And I'm thankful that he can, he can meet them according to his riches and glory. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. Listen now. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to to sing God's been good we'll have him sing and have the preacher I want to say something before I sing we uh, this week was awesome I mean everybody that came knows that 
We, um, this week, my, my oldest daughter, I wouldn't embarrass her, but I'm going to embarrass her is what I'm, what I'm trying to say here. But she's a sweetheart, but she told me on the way home from one of the services that this week changed her. And uh, she, she's been with some friends to some other places and things, and she said the, the sweetest thing she could have said to me or the thing that makes me the proud, she said, Dad, I see the importance of the old-time way of worshiping. And I was like, it just... It just filled me to overflowing because it's not that they're bad. They're wonderful kids. But the world is tearing them completely away from this kind of worship. And I want my kids to worship the way I did, the way my family did. And uh, me and me and Den talk about this sometimes. We're going down the road. We always talk about church or something. And it's up to my age group to kind of keep our kids in this way of worship. And if we don't pick up the reins, it's going to die. And... I, I want to be faithful. I want to stand behind what our preachers do and show my kids why, why it's necessary for us to worship this way. And, and I'm not ashamed uh, to worship the way we do. And sometimes I, I worry, I don't know why, but in my head I worry about when visitors come and, and the service kind of goes a little crazy. But I'm not ashamed of that, and I'm not going to apologize for it. And so I want my kids to see that, and I'm thankful we have a church that they do see it on a regular basis. So. Lately I've been looking back along this winding road To the old familiar markers of the mercies I have known And I know it may sound simple, but it's more than a cliché There's no better way to tell you than to say God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I know I've had some hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. Because through it all, God's been good Time's replayed and I can see That I've cried some bitter tears But I felt His arms around me As I faced my greatest fears You see, I've had more gains than losses and I've felt more joy than hurt As His grace rolls down to me Undeserved For God's been good In my life I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams When I go to sleep each night and though I know I've had some hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. Cause through it all, God's been good. For God has been my Father, my Savior, and my friend. His love was my beginning. And His love will be my end And I could spend forever trying To tell you everything He is But the best way I could say it Is this God's been good in my life, I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. 
And though I know I've had some hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could. Cause through it all, preacher this morning is a, a good friend of mine. Uh, he had the unfortunate task of having me as a roommate in college. And if it didn't get that worse, I went on to uh, my sophomore year, he had my brother as a roommate in college. So he's had both of us. You pray for him. But Brad Ryan, he's the senior pastor at Ina Friel Baptist Church up in southern Illinois, Ina, Illinois. He is the uh, son-in-law to brother Tom Malone and sister Verna Malone. Uh, in fact, I was told he is the favorite son-in-law of Brother Tom and Sister Verna. Uh, he married their youngest daughter, Tommy Jo, and we're happy to have him here this morning. Would you make welcome Brother Brad Ryan as he preaches for us? Thank you, buddy. I love you. Hey, love you too. All right. I can confirm that. I am indeed the favorite son-in-law, Brother Malone, Sister Malone, and uh, it is an honor to be here today uh, to preach uh, it's always an honor to talk about my Lord, and that's what I'm grateful to be able to be uh, to do here this morning. And yes, those were difficult years in college. Uh, people this week have asked, I don't know how many times, who who are you? And you know, with everybody, y'all know everybody else that has been preaching this week. Uh, I, I am just a, just a preacher from Southern Illinois, a pastor. In fact, I'm very privileged today to have a couple of my own here. Uh, they uh, have been suffering for Jesus down here in Florida for a couple of weeks or a couple of months now. And uh, they'll, they'll still be here a little bit longer before I get to have them back home uh, with us, as it should be, by the way. But anyway, I miss them, and I'm very grateful to, that they're here today. And, and, but people have asked, who are you? And, and I'm, just, I'm just me. But several years ago, God gave me the privilege to get associated and become associated with folks from this church. And yes, indeed, during those trying years at Bible college, I, I guess the Lord was testing me when I showed up my sophomore year and there was a, a, a young man by the name of Willie Odell Beauchamp that was going to be my roommate. I thought, Lord, what are you doing to me from Southern Illinois and this crazy from Florida? And yet... Uh, God did show me some things and teach me some things, but he wasn't through evidently when the next year he gave me the second of the Beauchamp brothers. And I said, God, what are you doing to me? And yet I today could not, uh, uh, could not have found or uh, been associated with two finer young men. And it was during that time that, uh, that I really began to learn some things about uh, this place down here. In fact, I think I was as excited whenever those care packages would come, Willie, and I don't know where Miss Susie is here today. When those care packages would come and those boys would open up those boxes, I was as excited as they were because, uh, because there was always something in there for me. Uh, and I began to get a sense of the graciousness of that family uh, because, I, boy, there was cookies or there was something in there, there was something specially in there for me on each one of those things. And then I began to realize that's just the nature of all the folks down here at Sefner Church. I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for your ministry, for your love for the Lord. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thankful that you've loved Brother Tom and Miss Malone. Yeah. And, and they enjoy being here. Now, folks, listen to me. I can understand loving my mother-in-law. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. That's, yes, sir. She's a sweetheart. She's easy to love, but... <laughs> My father-in-law, on the other hand, you put up with him, and I'm grateful for that. No, he's a good one. I'm going to hear about that later on. Couldn't ask for a better mother and father-in-law. I'm grateful to be able to preach the Word of God. I'm thankful right now. I know that uh, there are many of my folks gathered right now praying back home. God has been good to me. I'm in my 14th year there at Ina. God, has, uh, God still has stuff for me to do there. As Brother Hoy reminded me the other night and again this morning, I'm excited. My heart's been revived. I'm thankful for the privilege to be here and be with you all, and I'm ready to get back to work in southern Illinois. But before that happens, we get to see what the Lord wants for us here today. So take your Bibles, turn to the first chapter of the book of Nehemiah. 
This is an exciting, uh, really an exciting book. It's one of those passages that uh, really every time I come back to it, I'm stirred and reminded and challenged at what God has in store for me. I was reminded even as I was looking at it again this morning that Nehemiah is one of those characters, while we know a lot about him, there might be some things that are not as familiar. You see, to the average uh, student of the Word, if I were to ask them to tell me what they know about Moses, they could go through so many different things. If I were to ask them to tell me what they know about someone like David, uh, they would tell me so many different things. And honestly, if you begin to look at those men's lives, you can really begin to see how God was preparing them for a special purpose early on in their lives. In fact, who was it that sang today? Kevin. Kevin. Right there, brother. Is that you, Kevin? You're the one I was looking at. Okay, I was seeing from the back. Now I'm seeing from the front. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm, I, I was encouraged your daughter was challenged this week. Yeah. God, even this week, was pre preparing her for something yeah, right. down the road. You see, we can go to those times in Moses' life and David's life and we can see how God was doing something amazing in their life early on. And he was doing the same thing in Nehemiah's life. He had perfectly prepared Nehemiah for the task that would come later. And if you begin to look further down, and we won't be able to do justice to this book today, but if you were to look further down, you would see that purpose would be to rebuild the walls that had broken down and to, and to restore what uh, some, some amazing things that needed to go on there in, in the city of Jerusalem with his people. God had a special plan. Yeah. And just as God did for him, he has a purpose for every single one of us. And some of you have been realizing that even this past week. So as we come to this today, let's just take a look and, and read the word and see what we can, first of all, begin to understand about God's man in this place, and then we'll go a little bit further with it. The Bible says in the very first verse, the words of Nehemiah. Yeah. So these are his words here. It says, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that tells us something very important about Nehemiah. It tells us that he was in the palace of a king. He wasn't in the palace in Jerusalem. He was in the palace of, in a foreign land. Look what it says there, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, tells us something else very important about Nehemiah, that he was a Jewish man. When Hananiah, one of his brethren, comes, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left in the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and I mourned certain days. The Bible means many days there. Certain days. Many days I wept, I prayed, I fasted before the God of heaven. Now we look at these verses, four verses there. We say, does it tell us much about Nehemiah? It does tell us a great deal about God's man in this place. And I just want us to see that, first of all. We know that he was there in uh, the capital city. Uh, we know something other about him. And, and just for a moment, skip with me down to the very last phrase of verse 11. Really, the very last phrase of this first chapter. It says, for I was the king's cupbearer. So here we have a Jewish man in the palace of a foreign king, Artaxerxes, serving in a very high position. It was not something that was very common for a man like Nehemiah to be in this particular position, but it was a very important position. He was an official of high rank. He served there in the royal court. And we look at it and we say, why was he here? Well, first of all, God wanted him to be here. Anybody today wonder why I'm here? God wanted you to be here today. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God wanted Nehemiah to be in this particular place at this particular moment in history. And there's never any indication that Nehemiah had done wrong to be here. Here's the thing, reason I believe that Nehemiah was here. He was honest. Yeah. He was trustworthy. Yeah. He was the type of man that when the king looked at him, he says, you know what? I want someone like that to watch my back. I want someone like that to be my confidant. I want someone like that to be my friend. Listen to me. Let's just stop right here and say, my friends, the child of God ought to be the most honest person in the house. Amen. Child of God ought to be Amen. the most trustworthy one. We are to be the ones that people look at and say, I want to be like that. I want that one to pray for me. I want that one to encourage me. Here was a man. This is the, the picture that we are seeing here of Nehemiah. We see something else. He asked this question. His brethren come down. I'm just trying to very quickly paint this picture, okay? He asked this question. 
What's going on with my brothers and sisters back home? Here's a man that's not so preoccupied with his position in this king's court, but he's concerned with what's going on back home. And when they tell him the news, what happens? He cries. The effects of this news are great. It burdens him. It bothers him. Why is he bothered by what's going on here? Because they are in great distress. Their hearts are hurting. Their homes are destroyed. They're, rump, they're, 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 they're lost. They're scattered. They have not that which they used to have. That which they had experienced when they were faithfully serving the Lord, that is gone. It's, there's, there's devastation. There's, there's a heartache. There's, there's grief. There's all of these things. And when the child of God hears it here, it breaks his heart. I want to tell you something, my friends, as we're setting this stage. Um, I believe what broke Nehemiah's heart on this day was not just the fact that they were physically hurting. But it was the reason why they were physically hurting. And it was because of the sin. It was because of the rejection. It was because of the rebellion. It was because of the fact that years ago they had followed after the pagan gods and now they were reaping the results of what happens when we disobey God, when we turn away from Him. And it broke his heart. Listen... It's one thing, I, I can get hurt, I can feel frustrated when something physically happens to me. I can get uh, uh, upset, and we all understand what that means. But are we as upset as Nehemiah was when we find out what sin has done in the lives of someone that we know and love? See, we're seeing the effects of sin. And, and listen to me, don't be so foolish to think that uh, when you disobey what God tells you to do, you're affecting no one but yourself. You see, when I disobey God's word, I affect my wife. And when I transgress God's law, my children will be affected. And when I transgress God's law, my people in my church that God's given me to minister with and to serve with, they will be affected. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something. When I transgress God's law, my friend here will be affected. It will break his heart. And vice versa, if that happens, sin messes things up. It, and, and, it, and when we do that, there will be those consequences. There will be those problems. But let me ask you right now, my friends, are we as brokenhearted about the effects of sin in other people's lives as Nehemiah was? So here he is. This is what we see about him. And so as we come to the rest of this particular chapter right here, we are reminded that I believe something that's very important about the believer. We are reminded and we are getting a picture here, if you will, that Nehemiah was someone who was in tune with what God was trying to tell him to do. You see, he hears the bad news. It affects him in a great way. And so what does he do? He begins to fast and he begins to pray. You see, in that moment, Nehemiah lays aside the luxuries of that palace so that he might give himself to prayer. And it is that prayer specifically that I want us to consider here for the remainder of this time today as we come before the Lord's Word. Look with me at the very next verse and let's ask some questions here. As we go through it, I want you to look at it. Pick it out. Think about it. What are the elements of this prayer? Am I praying this way? Is this the way I approach my God? Look with me at verse 5. And he says, after praying before the God of heaven, or after beginning this prayer, verse 5, Nehemiah says, And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. And then he says, Lord, remember... I want you to know that I remember. I remember 
And I beseech thee the word that you or thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. I remember what you have said, Lord, about what happens if we disobey. But God, I also remember, look at verse 9, But if you will turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. There is key to the prayer that we are praying right there, a key to what will happen later on found right there at the end of verse number 11. You see, Nehemiah knew he needed to do something. Nehemiah knew God had a plan for him. Nehemiah knew there was a special purpose that he had been placed in that position for, but that purpose included and involved going before that wicked king, and he knew that was something that didn't just happen, uh, that God had to be in on it, and so he begins to pray. And so what do we see about this prayer? Let me give you a few elements of it today. And I want you to ask yourselves, do I see these things in my own life? Yeah. You see, first of all, he was very serious when he went into prayer. I was reminded today in Sunday school that we need to be serious when we talk to God. Amen. We need to pay attention to what we're doing when we're talking to God. Verse 4 tells us he mourned, he wept, he fasted. It was the outcome of a soul that had been stirred to its utmost depths. Uh, in his heart and, and I was reminded how often I begin to pray and really I've been convicted this past week I, I love to talk to God and, and I try to make it a, a pattern in my life that whatever happens it's just an opportunity to say Lord thank you and an opportunity to praise him and an opportunity to, to check uh, my own heart and things like that but I was convicted at the fact that there are times I might start into prayer but my mind is elsewhere you know sometimes preachers minds are pulled in different directions I can be talking to one person and thinking about what's going on with this person and worrying about what's going to happen with this person when they see me the next time. And all of these things that go on, we get distracted. We need to be earnest. We need to be serious about what's going on. We need to realize how ne what Nehemiah realized, that prayer is a great privilege and it's a mighty force that we are asking and offered and given the ability to enter into. So he was serious. But I want us to notice something else. Look at verse 5. Here's a man as he began to pray, began to confess and began to believe and began to let God know what he knew to be true about God himself. Now that's very important. God is good. I love the song that was sung, God is good. God is good. Did you notice what Nehemiah did? He said, God, you're good. He said, you are a great God. A great God. We need to know what we know about God. We need to believe what we know to be true about God. And we need to proclaim what we know to be true about God. And it's included in our prayers that we do this. God, you are a great God. How many today would testify to the fact that he's a great God? How many today would testify to the fact that he's a faithful God? Because that's what Nehemiah did. You're faithful. How many would testify to the fact that he's a merciful God? Uh, I was roommates with this fellow. Praise God for his mercy and grace, right? God's grace is amazing. No, I'm just, Will was a good man. Your pastor was a good man. Here we go. Too late. Have I already ruined it? Okay. God's mercy is wonderful. Did you notice what he said there? God, you're terrible. Oh, I'm not going to, I wouldn't say God's terrible. No, that's an awful word. We can't say God's terrible. You better say God's terrible. You better believe God's terrible. You see, when that word, you see it, it means, it means awesome. And it carries with it the idea and it's connected to his holiness. And folks, if you don't believe he's a holy God, then you are... If you don't believe that he is a holy God, then you don't understand how much he hates sin. And you don't understand what it took to make sure your sins could be forgiven. And we are making a mockery of what Jesus did if we were not willing to stand and say, God, you are a terrible God. You are a holy God. You are an awesome God. Do you know what you believe to be true about God? Folks, listen to me. The church 
And I love the church. Folks, I'm a pastor. My heart is for the church. That's what God's called me to do. But I'm convinced today that many in the church need to get back to the place where we see God for who he is. And stop trying to put him in a nice, neat little box of our own choosing that makes us feel a little bit better about the things that are going on in our lives. Know what we know and believe what we know to be true about God and use that when we come before him, tell him what we know. And so we see his earnestness. We see him uh, believing the things that he believed. But then we begin to see the request itself and the petition itself. Look at verse 6. Look at what it says there. Let thine ear now be attentive. You know what it means there? It means he, he's saying, please, God. Please. And it all, anybody that has little children right now in your lives, you can understand a little bit what Nehemiah is doing here. He's like that child that's been told, no, it's raining outside. You don't need to go in the yard and they're bored and they're tired of being in the house. Please, can I go outside now? Please, can I go outside now? Please, can I go outside now? There's that idea. That, that's what Nehemiah is doing. He's being repetitious here. He is not giving up early. I was reminded of my little boy. Jack is 10 years old. And God's given me four wonderful children, a beautiful wife. My oldest is in college up at Welch. I've got a sophomore a daughter, 16, two driving now. And, uh, and uh, uh, another girl that's finishing up her eighth grade year that's 13. Three teenage girls in the house at the same time. Brother Tom, I've watched him a little bit. and I, I learned a little bit about him. But then God gave us our little boy. Now, Jack... Jack's different, but the thing that I thought about when I was thinking about this, Jack's always had chronic ear problems ever since he was young. And in his little life, he's had three major ear surgeries where they've gone in and had to take out. And, and thankfully, it's been non-cancerous, but very, very evasive uh, tumors and growths that really were trying to do a little more damage. Jack's a great kid, and, and, and so many other things that are going on in life, but that, that's something that he struggled with, you know, a little bit. But we would always go up to these hospitals. And so I, I went up to the hospital one time for a checkup, and Jack's always different on the way up than he is coming home because on the way up, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And when he gets to the doctor's office, there's one of two things that can happen. If he goes to the right door, it's going to be a good day because in the right door... And in the right room, they just sit in there and they, the doctor looks a little bit and doesn't do much. But if he goes into the left door, there's a chair in the left door that uh, that's, means he's going to get, there's going to be some poking, there's going to be some things going on, and it's not going to be very good. Well, this particular day, we got up there and I was looking at him, watched him, had my hand on his shoulder, and the doctor said, come on in here and open that right door. And we went in, and all Jack's mood changed, everything was great. It's going to be a great day. Everything was good. We went through that appointment. Everything was fine. We're going down. He's a different boy. He's a new kid. We're going down the elevator. And we get to the lobby, and I see this sign over there. It says, free flu shots. And I think to myself, man, there's nobody in line. It's free. We could fill it out, take care of Jack. Won't have to take another trip. He and I can get our flu shots. And so I just stop there, and we go into this line. And Jack goes, what are we doing, Daddy? And I said, well, son, there's something here that can help us not get sick later on. What's going to help us not get sick later on, he says. I said, well, son, um, it's a little shot. and It's not going to hurt much. It'll be more like a prick, just a pinch and, and this and that. And then, and then it'll be over and you won't even know it. Daddy, please don't make me get a full shot. And he's whispering, please, please, please. Please, Daddy. Now, that Jack's please whispering was a little as loud as many people hollering. Please, Daddy, don't make me get that flu shot. I said, son, listen, this will be good. It's for your own good. Let's, let's get this done and be over with. Daddy, I won't get sick. I said, honey, you don't know if you're going to get sick. Let's try this so we don't. Dad, I promise if you don't make me get this shot, I won't get sick. Now, I'm going to tell you what, Brother Will. At that moment, Jack was as earnest as any kid I've ever seen. He was as serious in that request and that petition and that you know asking of, of his father as anybody. Listen to me. Are we as serious as that little boy was when we come before our Heavenly Father? Do we plead for him? Do we ask him, please, Lord, give me this thing. Please, Lord, help me in this situation. Please, Lord, help me do what I need to do for you. Are we as serious in this? you see, friends, it's serious business. On Wednesday nights, we've been going through a Bible study, Wednesday night Bible study, 
really by the time it's done, when we go through this verse by verse study of the book of Exodus, it'll be over a year. And, and I know you can go longer, but sometimes we take one verse, sometimes we take ten. Yeah. Sometimes we'll cover a chapter, but you just never know. But I was reminded of this even this morning as I was uh, coming back before the, the, uh, the Lord uh, in thinking of this service of, of something that happened. You remember in Exodus where uh, Joshua was down in the battle, down in the valley, he was getting ready to lead the, the men that had been chosen to do the fighting against the enemy Amalek. And they're down there in the trenches. And it was bloody. You know it was bloody. There was fighting going on. A war was, that was taking place. A battle was being waged. You remember this story as Moses stood up on the hill and as long as his hands were raised, Israel prevailed. His hands began to fall. The enemy would begin to prevail. And we look at that and we say, oh, how tough and how awful it was down in the trenches. And yes, I know it was awful down in there. Someone might look at it and say, you know, that's where the battle was being fought. Uh, Abraham or Moses, pardon me, had it, had it safe up on the hill. But folks, I'm convinced today the real battle, the real test the real battle was going on up on that mountain when God's man was raising his hands and pleading and pleading and pleading on behalf of the ones that were down. Yes. You say, well, my arms are tired. It's yeah. going to get tired. Yeah. But we can't quit. We've got to be uh, persistent in what we need and what we do when we come before the Lord. And so we see the earnestness and we see what he knows to be true about God and we see the request, but then we see something else very important. Look at verses 6 and 7. What's he doing in those verses? Look at it. Look at verses 6 and 7 again. You got your Bible? Someone tell me. What's he doing? Talk to me. He's praying. Specifically, what's he saying? What's he say? He's confessing. I heard it. He's confessing. Look, look at it, at what he says. In particular, we have sinned. You know, it's easy to say we've sinned. But then what does he say? Then he says, I've sinned. I've sinned personally. We acted corruptly against you, God. We did not keep your commandments, God. Hear my prayer. We have sinned. How in the world can we expect to prevail with God in prayer if there's never any confession made of the deceitfulness or the sin which has made our lives barren and unproductive before Him in the first place? It's beyond me. How many times people come to me and say, Preacher, why can't I get ahead? Why do these bad things keep happening? Now, now listen to me. I fully understand that we live in a sin-fallen world yeah. where bad things happen to God's people all the time. That we are not immune. I've got a family right now back home that's grieving. I'm going to go home and do a funeral for a little girl whose daddy died yesterday, Friday. Their hearts are hurting. She loves God with all her heart. I understand that. I'm not telling you today that every time there's a difficult situation that arises in her life, it's because of unconfessed sin. But a lot of times it is. A lot of times we say, why, why, you know, I've seen them. Why does this keep happening to me, preacher? Why can't we seem to get ahead? And maybe today there's someone in here who is experiencing this spiritual bondage and, and maybe your, your, your prayer life is a, is a desert wasteland. It seems barren and unfruitful and unproductive. It could be that you need to fall before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me of this. And hear my prayer. And so you see, he was, he was urgent. He was earnest and sincere. He was confessing those things which needed to be confessed. And, and folks, there's so much more that we could do, but moving along here very quickly, let me just bring you to this last thought. And it's found down in verse 11. We see the results of all of this, or we see a part of praying that sometimes we, we drop the ball on. You say, how many would agree with me? We need to be sincere when we pray to God. Everybody shake their hand and say yes. And, and how many would say, yes, we need to request. We need to be uh, persistent in that and not give up. Uh, and we would agree to that. And, and we would say, yes, we definitely need to confess. And, and we need to be honest before God about who He is and believe it and live it in our lives. Yes, we would agree. But then we come to this part of Nehemiah's prayer, and this is where we're not willing to go all the way. You say, what is it? What's found there in verse 11. 
In fact, three times throughout verse 11, you see one particular word. You see the word servant. See it? Or servants. What does a servant do? He serves. Now, what does a servant do? He does everything that the master says to do. He does everything that the Lord of the house says to do. The servant doesn't say, you know what, I think we should do this. He says, not my will, whatever your will is, that's what I will do. And so here's Nehemiah. He's pleading with the Lord. He needs this. He needs what God to do what only God can do in this particular situation. And he is praying, believing, and willing to consecrate himself fully to what God would have in store for him. Look at verse 11, what it says there. And there's that phrase talking about the servants. Look at the phrase, who desire to fear thy name. You see, here was a man who says, my great desire, God, is to live in the fear of your holy name. You know, it was at this point I was reminded of a marvelous passage in John chapter 2. Of course, we, the beginning of John chapter 2 is the story of the, that first miracle of the Lord there when he came to Cana of Galilee and, and he performed the miracle and, and everything that he was doing there. And Of course, it was a, if you look at the beginning of that, Mary was very upset and she comes to her Lord and her son, and I don't know if she was trying to, to, uh, to you know, exert a little parental authority or whatever, but she knew Jesus could do something about the problem and the situation. Lord, uh, we've got a problem here. And we look at what Jesus said to her, and he was not disrespectful to his mother at all. Uh, the word woman or the term woman was a term of endearment and, and compassion. He said, woman, what have I to do with you? And you say, what's he talking about? And, and we know what he's talking about. He confirms it there in the very next phrase when he said, my hour has not yet come. This is not part of the sermon. You won't find it in Nehemiah here. Well, actually, you can see Christ Jesus and all through the Old Testament. But can I stop right here and ask you this question? Aren't you thankful God in the Son was never deterred from his purpose? Huh? Aren't you thankful that there in that moment he says, you know what? My will is to do the will of the Father. My purpose has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. And he kept his eye on that purpose because if he had been detoured, folks, we'd have nothing to praise God about today. We'd have nothing to shout about today. We wouldn't have a leg to stand on. But praise God, he fulfilled it. He went through and he paid my sin debt. And now I can stand in joy. And I can stand in forgiveness. And I can stand in victory this morning. But when you look at that verse, and this is, that was not even, that, that was, let me see, this is the reason I was going here to begin with. In John chapter 5, or John chapter 2, verse 5, we see what I'm, what I'm getting at. Mary, after Jesus had gently rebuked her, she didn't get upset. She didn't get her feelings hurt, men, women, ladies. She, look at what she did in verse 5. She turned to the servants and she said, fellas, anything he tells you to do, do it. Anything he tells you to do, do it. Folks, I'm convinced today there are many in the church, many in this place today. We are willing to do many of the things that the Lord wants us to do, but there are fewer still who are willing to do all that Jesus tells us to do. Right here we have God's man saying, Lord, I am consecrated to you. Whatever your will is for my life, that's what I will be fully submitted to. Lord, I am consecrated to serving you. What an amazing prayer. As we come to the end of it right now, I just want to ask you, my friends. You know, we've considered the, the character of Nehemiah before God on this day. And, but I want to ask you what might be lacking in your life. I understand that we're a gracious and humble people in this place today. I understand that you've come today because you love God. But I also know that we're not perfect. Amen. And I know that in a gathering like this, there are often many issues that God is trying to deal with. And I wonder today what the Spirit of God has been speaking to your heart about just now. 
And I want to ask you if you, like Nehemiah, would be moved to compassion. The effects of sin in someone's life. Maybe today for you the elements of this prayer are lacking. Maybe confession needs to be made. Maybe you need to be more persistent. Maybe you need to be set apart or consecrated. Folks, I'm convinced that God has big plans in store for your life. I know that God wants to use you, but there could be some today that are falling short. You see, if you were to go further through this book, you would see how God begins to answer this prayer of the first chapter. But I'm going to tell you something today, my friends. If Nehemiah's heart had not first been moved, if his heart had not first been melted, he never could have done the work that God had for him afterwards. Maybe our hearts need to be broken right now. Can I tell you a story? It's about a girl. Her name is Caitlin. She just turned 19. She's a freshman in college. Back in the summer... She received word that her dad was, uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And when she began to talk to our youth pastor about it, she's been involved in our youth group for about three years now. She's a faithful young lady. She's growing in the Lord. She's one of those that you look at and you say, that's one of the leaders in our group. But when she began to hear about this and they were given the news, while she would raise her hand, According to my youth pastor, while she would raise her hand, while she would request prayer, and while she would just, just do these things, and when she would talk to me, Brother Brad, she would say, uh, pray for my dad. But her main concern was not the physical. Yes, that was important to her. Her concern was the fact that her daddy was lost. Her daddy was unsaved. Pray that daddy would come to know the Lord. Brother Jason and I, my youth pastor, God's given me a wonderful man to serve with me there in Ina and he and I went to St. Louis a couple of months ago, tried to make a run. He was up there having some procedures. We went in. We introduced ourselves to Kevin. First time we'd ever seen Kevin. We said, Kevin, you know why we've come? Well, I know you're from the church. Yes, we've come, Kevin, because you've got a daughter that loves you greatly. Yes. We've come because we care about you. But I said, Kevin, we've also come because there's a Lord in heaven that cares about you. We began to talk to him. Kevin really wasn't interested. It was one of those situations where we knew if we went further, we wouldn't be doing right. We needed right. to stop. Oh yeah. So we went away and we kept praying. Pray for my dad that he gets saved. Yes. Pray for my dad, tears rolling down her face, that he gets saved. I don't know how many times. Pray for my dad that he gets saved. Folks, eight days ago, a week ago yesterday, I'm driving down the road. I get a phone call. A man in my church, he said, yeah. he said, Brother Brad, he said, I want you to know they've given Kevin maybe two weeks to live. Yeah. He said, Brother Brad, I know what you do on Saturday nights, and I know what your plan is. Folks, my, my people hear it. I, I try to teach and preach. Listen, you begin to prepare for what goes on oh, on yeah. Sunday morning on Saturday oh, night. My, yeah. You get ready to worship God on Sunday morning, but it starts on Saturday night. Don't be running around, carrying on all hours. Come refreshed, ready, prepared to meet with God. He said, I know it's Saturday night. It's going to be a late night. They're still in St. Louis. I said, I said, Rob, there's nothing more important than a lost soul. I said, don't worry about that. Amen. And folks, I'm going to tell you, at 1030, eight days ago, 1030, on a Saturday night, I'm sitting around. My youth pastor's there. I walked in. I said, Kevin, you know why we've come? God bless you. He bless said, you, uh, he said yeah. I said, you've got a daughter that loves you. Yeah. In fact, her heart's been broken. She's cried and shed tear after tear after tear, broken. I said, we love you, Kevin, but there's a Lord in heaven that loves you more. The tears begin to flow and praise God that night, Kevin. God's still in the business of saving souls. That man gave his heart to the Lord, the most precious, tender, eight days ago. Last night, I sat there with him, and he said, Lord, come in, save me, be the Lord of my life. And for as long as you give me left, Lord, I will serve you. But folks, sometimes the waters are bitter, right? Sometimes there's difficulty in the middle of, a doc, I think was it Dr. Arthur preaching about the bitter waters the other night. In the middle of that, I was receiving these texts and I didn't know it until afterwards. Hospice had been called. Things were moving along quickly. At 11.30 on Friday morning, they said maybe two days. At 1.30 Friday afternoon, God took him home. Folks. He is in heaven because there was a little girl whose heart was broken at the effects of sin in his life and his lost condition. Who do you need to weep over? Can I tell you another story? Her name's Olivia. Now listen to this. 
Her name's Olivia. Olivia's had a burden in our youth group for kids in the community. Yeah. Olivia's been going out of her way to invite some of the kids, and there's a lot of little knuckleheads there in Illinois running around that need the Lord. But Olivia has been going out of her way to make sure they come to youth group on Wednesday night. And I don't know what happened on Wednesday night's youth group there back home, but it must have been a good time. Because when I came back to the hotel, I decided to call home. Uh-huh. And I waited until about 10 o'clock our time, or 10 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock here, 10 o'clock our time. Hopefully, Tom, I get confused. Hopefully, Tommy Joe would be ready. And uh, that's my wife. Maybe she'd be able to, to sit just a little bit and talk a little bit. And I got on the phone. She said, Dad, she said, Brad, your youngest daughter's heart is breaking right now. You see, the Olivia I'm telling you about is my 13 year old. Her name's oh, Olivia man. Grace. I said, what's her heart breaking over? She said, she's breaking, her heart's breaking over Tyson. I said, what's going on? She said, you know, she's been inviting Tyson to church. He came to church tonight. She said, Brad, about 15 minutes ago, he called. He said, Livia, what do I need to do to be saved? And Olivia, who had been crying over this and weeping over these condition of the lost uh, souls there in her community, had the privilege. And I was able to listen to it on the other end. And you know what? The greatest thing that happened to me Wednesday was not Brother Gibbs, and that was amazing. But the greatest thing that happened to me was when I listened to my 13-year-old lead someone to the Lord on the phone. And folks, I begin to shout in that room. They begin to bang on the walls. If you get, some, if someone complains, someone got saved the other night. That's what the noise was coming from in our house. But hear me now, folks. God is still in the business of saving souls but it wouldn't have happened on Wednesday night if that little girl hadn't been broken hearted over his sinful condition and folks I'm convinced there are souls that need to be saved all around this church and all around where we live but the church needs to be broken over the condition of sin are you broken today I'm going to ask you to bow your heads I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I don't know how the spirit of God has been speaking to you during this time today, but there are a lot of different directions that it could have gone, I know. But I know he's been speaking. And I know that having been confronted with the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God, there are two ways that we could go. We could listen to it and just leave it behind. Or we can hear what he's telling us to do and we can respond. Who do you know right now that you need to weep over? Yes. Who do you know right now that you need to be broken hearted over? Who right now will you be willing to pay the price for? Who right now will you be willing to call on before God right now? Weep over, pray over and bring them before the Lord. Or maybe today there's another issue. Maybe you need to be consecrated. Maybe you are in danger of missing some of what God has in store for you and you'd say, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. Show me what I need to do. As the musicians begin to play softly. I'm going to ask you to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If God has spoken to your heart and there's something you need to talk to him about, would you come? Would you come? Brother Roger's going to lead us. Would you come? The things that I love come? and hold deep. What will you do? Who will you pray heart? over? Who do you need to respond to? Borrowed, but not mine. Who right now oh, is counting on you to pray for them? Who right now Jesus is counting on you? Their very eternal existence depends on what you will do right now for them. Who will you burden over? God is still in the business of saving souls, but He's looking for His church to be broken. What will you do? What will you do? Yes. Roll back. God is good. Nothing good have I done to deserve God's own son. I am not worthy of the stars in his hands. Yet he 
to come this morning someone in your life you need to pray for this is the opportunity I guarantee there was someone that prayed for you when you were lost maybe you need to pray for someone so I get the deacons come forward this time preacher a hand for a wonderful message this morning. Praise God. God. Help us to take it to heart, everything that he said. And we thank God for Brad and his ministry. I'm going to have to ask